Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. After running virtually unchallenged, Egypt's incumbent president, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, has won a second term in office to lead a country where unrest since 2011 has devastated its economy. To discuss President Sisi's expected challenges during his second term in office, I'm joined here in the studio by Dr. Mikhail Barak, who is a senior researcher and project manager at the International Institute for Counterterrorism. Welcome. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Ms. Paula Sleer, who is the Middle East Bureau Chief at Russia Today. Welcome. Thank you. Mr. Oren, give us a broader understanding towards uh, what President Sisi is due to expect. It's probably one of the toughest jobs in the world, presiding over a country such as Egypt, with its uh, economic, uh, social, um, and even military and diplomatic uh, problems. And uh, the Egyptian military has seen itself much like the Turkish military uh, pre-Erdogan as the guardian of the state. And uh, former General Abdel Fattah Sisi comes from this tradition. So um, personal ambition aside, one can expect him to try to use his second term in office to salvage Egypt from the uh, abyss um, where it uh, has fallen to and uh, could uh, get even deeper. And uh, therefore, he must have alliances, both domestic and foreign. And um, obviously, democracy purists around the world, especially in the United States, uh, have seen fit to criticize him. And yes, indeed, it wasn't uh, the purest of democratic uh, exercises, but nevertheless, in the political culture of uh, Egypt, it was the least worst outcome. Uh, Dr. Barak, President Sisi faced a very challenging start to his first term in an office with uh, an American president who voiced uh, uh, vocal support to the person he ousted uh, at the time, uh, the president of Egypt, uh, uh, Muhammad Mursi, who was elected in a democratic election for the first time in that country. Uh, of course, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and the aspirations of uh, Muhammad Mursi were not uh, the, the focal point of President Obama. But uh, when we're looking at President Sisi now in, in his uh, success in entering his second term in office, uh, to what extent does a more welcoming attitude toward him from the U.S. administration, from other administrations around the world, provide him with a stronger mandate towards a future uh, of an Egypt that is in a critical situation? Yes, yeah, so we should remember that <coughs> Egypt is one of uh, the important allies of the uh, United States and the Sunni bloc against Iran in the region. And uh, there is a cooperation with Saudi Arabia and Israel uh, to uh, block this uh, influence. And uh, let's say that after the promination of uh, Trump to the pre pre presidency, he, um, there, there is a change, shift in the uh, interest, uh, shift in the policy, and Trump is encouraging Sisi to do what he's doing now, to promote Egypt and to become a, a regional uh, power in the region. Egypt is supposed to stabilize Let's say that because of the growing terror in Libya and the Sinai Peninsula, Egypt is a very strong ally and a partner we, to, to uh, fight against it. And he is winning the support mm. of uh, Trump. Ms. Slear, with regard to Moscow, of course, Moscow uh, welcomes Sisi with open arms. They have various deals uh, uh, together, President Putin and his Egyptian counterpart, on the matters of uh, security as well as on energy and other aspects of uh, bilateral relations that have improved significantly since Sisi took office. To what extent does his second term in office uh, bolster uh, those relations, even though it was to be expected that he would be reelected? I mean, it was expected, and no doubt it will bolster the relationship between the two. You, of course, have had an election in Russia as well, which many have drawn parallels between the Russian election that saw President Putin being re-elected and the election in Egypt that saw Sisi re-elected. They're both similar personalities. They're strong leaders. People do call them dictators. They both saw practically no opposition to their re-election. The question, of course, in Egypt was the voter turnout as to how many people were actually going to come and show Sisi that they 
they support him. His popularity is declining. If you look at the last election he had back in 2014, the most recent poll I could find suggested something like 24 points down in terms of how the population supported him then, which was a, a, a support in terms of his crackdown on Islamic extremism, terrorism. But that crackdown has gone overboard and any voices of dissent in Egypt are not tolerated by any extent. Vis-a-vis -vis Russia, again, the same parallels are made with the leadership style of the Russian president. The two countries have a strong partnership. The last time I was in Egypt reporting for Russian television, everywhere we went, we were welcomed. There were, when, when Putin visited Egypt a, short, uh, a while ago, there were posters of him everywhere. There was a feeling also that Russia had come to the party and was playing a more important role in the future of Egypt rather than the United States. And that, of course, would reference your earlier question in terms of how Egyptians felt betrayed by the fact that Barack Obama, who was then president of America, supported Mohamed Morsi being elected. Mr. Ogan, when President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi won his first term and, and got into office and, and secured his uh, uh, power for at least uh, the first term, he uh, situated himself in a point where he tried to emphasize to the Egyptian public that the situation is dire, that there is a lot of, uh, that there are a lot of challenges, including the, the various uh, extremist militants that are ongoingly trying to uh, battle the, the government, uh, his regime, as well as other uh, elements of economic despair that have plagued this country, which has a vast Muslim population, vast uh, Arab population, the biggest in the world uh, uh, today, at least. To what degree do you see this uh, mandate or the expectations that superseded the reality of being able to implement something concrete on the ground, uh, shifting to a more uh, understanding approach towards President Sisi and what he actually can achieve in the near future? There are two seemingly contradictory aspects to the um, nature of the Egyptian population. On the one hand, it's good natured. Um, it is um, much more um, sympathetic than uh, what you find in other places in the Levant, uh, easygoing. But on the other hand, Egypt as a country from time immemorial must have had a centralized government because of the centrality of the Nile, because of uh, what the government uh, from the pharaohs on had to do in order to harness nature to support uh, such a vast population. And because they were dependent on other countries, um, downriver or upriver, as the case may be, uh, Sudan, Ethiopia, um, and the like, um, a democratically elected, weak uh, central government uh, wasn't in the cards for Egypt. Now, is there uh, a middle way between democracy and dictatorship? in a country such as Egypt? Probably not, because the forces which you have mentioned are not for democracy. The Muslim uh, Brotherhood came to power through a democratically um, elected uh, system, but they would have uh, abused it. And this would have been the last uh, democratically. Well, uh, ousted President Mulsi he has indeed moved already on uh, uh, legal grounds to try and secure his government at the time. Indeed. So, so the American, the simplistic American interpretation of world events, uh, famously uh, reiterated by uh, then Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice as uh, uh, demanding fair, full, and free elections throughout the Middle East, simply is not applicable to Egypt except for Israel in this case. Uh, uh, Dr. Barak, when we're looking at uh, a month preceding the election, we saw uh, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi providing his security echelons with a mandate to defeat the Islamic State. Of course, the, the branch, uh, Wilayat Sinai, which was uh, uh, previously known as uh, Ansar Bet al-Makdis and had different forms uh, within the constellation of Islamist militancy. But uh, now that the Islamic State has uh, pretty much subsided from uh, the international headlines. We see uh, an organization that has lost its uh, grounds, uh, uh, swathes of land in both Syria as well as in Iraq, as well as in uh, neighboring Libya for that uh, 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 point. We suddenly see an Islamic state that 
its major foothold is now in Sinai, as opposed to other places. To what extent uh, did Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, prior to the election, uh, succeed in battling this organization? I uh, heard reports of about 1,000, uh, 1,200, there are different reports on the number of militants that were captured and uh, <laughs> hundreds more that were also killed. Was that a success in his eyes, or is it just a process uh, battling against an ideology that is, uh, quite frankly, impossible to defeat? Depends who you ask. For the Egyptian author- the Egyptian regime, of course, claimed that he is winning the battle and he succeeded to kill pro- uh, a, a, a senior a terrorist in Sinai Peninsula and the, and the ISIS in Sinai Peninsula is claiming that is that ISIS uh, that uh, Egypt since uh, the declaration of uh, opening this military campaign in uh, February 2018 that actually the Egyptian uh, army failed and they did not kill anyone from ISIS uh, members. So this is like a fight between counter narratives. Who is right? But if you check the field, you see that. Uh, ISIS and the Egyptian army are killing, they have success from both sides. And uh, this is, uh, let's say that the, until now, the Egyptian army did not is not succeeding to deliver the merchandise, is not succeeding in the field. And uh, this is a problem, a huge problem. And uh, this is because of uh, there is a support of the Bedouin, uh, some of the Bedouin uh, population in Sinai Peninsula because of the t- topography and because ISIS in uh, Sinai Peninsula is very clever and is uh, uh, making, uh, let's say, daring and uh, courage uh, uh, attacks against the Egyptian army. It tries to attract headlines. Not only that, not only that, but be, uh, let's say because of this uh, attack. Uh, because of this campaign, uh, ISIS in Sinai Peninsula sent uh, uh, its members to central cities in Egypt, and the Egyptian regime is not like to speak about it. And then we can witness, unfortunately, that ISIS is uh, uh, hurting and making suicide attack against the Copts, especially against the Copts, because this is play- playing on the religious uh, um, rift between. Mm-hmm. And uh, not only that, there are also uh, deserts. Uh, there are about, even the Egyptian regimes admitted that there are deserts. Uh, several hundreds of uh, Egyptian uh, soldiers left the army and joined to ISIS and also to Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda is also a prominent actor in the region. Mm-hmm. And let's not forget Libya, which there is a, a, a flowing uh, members, the crossing the, of terrorists that crossing the border and joined to ISIS and Al Qaeda. And most of the prominent actor in this matter is Isham Ashmawi, a mm-hmm. prominent Egyptian officer, and he is uh, like uh, established also a new offshoot, offshoot in Egypt. In Egypt, belongs to Al Qaeda. Mm-hmm. So it's well. Uh, we'll definitely look more into that, Ms. Lear. How do you perceive this? Well, the announcement came in February, so it needs to be put into the context of the elections. And there are those who suggest that he made the announcement that he was upping his military campaign in Sinai as an election promise, because of course one of the big concerns both for Egyptians and the international community, is how safe is Egypt today? You just need to look at the tourism industry, which has all but plummeted, and that was a cornerstone of the Egyptian economy. So there are also critics who say that the Egyptian army is struggling. I know you say that they're both sides, but that they have a lack of intelligence on the ground, that they're also quite a bureaucratic institution, as is a lot of Egypt. And so they struggle to actually get a hold on the militants in the Sinai Peninsula. As you mentioned, it's a, it's a neglected area, it's poor, it dates back to the time of, of President Mubarak, where not a lot of attention was paid there. And so it's a very lawless area that is really the perfect breeding ground for terrorist groups to, to operate. And this is why we see this, this closeness in relationship, if I can bring in Israel for a moment, between Egypt and Israel. They both share a common concern of what is happening in the Sinai Peninsula. You have had rockets that have been fired towards a light. You have the security concern there um, on the Egyptian side. And so we're seeing this closeness particularly on the military front, particularly vis-a-vis Sinai, between Israel and Egypt. And and by extension, that's why the United States wants Egypt to remain stable. That's why Israel wants Egypt to remain stable. And the most promising candidate to do that was LCC and and his crackdown on security. Mr. Olin? Um, In the uh, first 25 years of the existence of the State of Israel, from 1948 to 1973, the Egyptian military has waged six campaigns five against Israel and one in Yemen. In all of them, except in the last one, in 1973, um, it has not proved itself to be among the uh, best fighting forces uh, in the region. 
1973, yes, it initiated, it surprised, and uh, it uh, uh, managed to draw, at least. It didn't um, uh, defeat Israel, but wasn't defeated either. But for the last 45 years, the Egyptian military did not have any real experience in fighting, and and um, Daesh or its offshoot uh, in Sinai has posed a new threat to an old bureaucracy. Now, um, General um, Sisi comes from the military, as did Colonel Nasser and Colonel Sadat. But Nasser and Sadat, as well as Sisi, all um, have all come from the ground forces and uh, were more offensive in spirit. Mubarak, who was the longest serving of them all, came from the Air Force where he was not a fighter pilot. He was passive uh, in nature, very hesitant, and under him the military deteriorated. It uh, is now uh, coming back uh, into some sort of shape, but it is also being helped by Israel in the Sinai because Israel, according to reliable reports, have contributed not only intelligence, but also aerial support against those uh, strongholds of Daesh in the Sinai. And one should admit that the Sinai has always been the backyard for Egypt. Egypt didn't care for it. It wanted it back once Israel won it in 1967, but it never developed it and it neglected the population and now it is paying the price. Dr. Barak? How do you perceive this uh, uh, assessment of Mr. Owen? Yeah, I agree. But we, but uh, Egypt uh, took uh, part in uh, the coalition of Saudi Arabia in uh, uh, in Yemen. So they have a li- not on the ground, but they have more uh, experience in the air. Nevertheless, to what degree is this cooperation between Israel and Egypt vital for the success of President Sisi in combating uh, Wilayat Sina and uh, the other uh, elements uh, operating there? And to uh, what degree is uh, President Sisi actually able to secure somewhat of a stability uh, for his second term in order to establish uh, strong economic components of growth? So the New York Times uh, published an article about the cooperation, security cooperation between Israel and Egypt. And uh, the first response of the Egyptian regime was denying this uh, cooperation because it affects negatively on the public opinion of the Egyptians. They don't like the idea of that. But there is, according to reliable reports, a cooperation in Sinai Peninsula. And of course, uh, according to them, Israel supplying them uh, drones and uh, intelligence. And this is very important. If there is such a cooperation, this is very important. Uh, now, regarding uh, the security inside Egypt, if you want to win the battle, it's not enough to have uh, boots on the ground. You need to fight also ideologically. You have to recruit the civilian society, the media. And uh, in this case, uh, Al-Azhar, which is the most important, uh, let's say, religious establishment in the Sunni world, and of course in inside Egypt, is taking a crucial part on that is uh, also responsible in some way to change the curriculum, the education uh, uh, sources inside the schools. It's begin from elementary schools. Is responsible for a religious discourse between the Copts and uh, uh, the Sunnis in Egypt. And he also sent his own imams, not only to the mosque inside Egypt, Egypt but also to Europe to speak uh, among uh, the youngs in the mosque how it's important not to, how to avoid from ISIS uh, propaganda. And the, IC, and the CIS is trying to promote this uh, mm-hmm. Elazar as a prominent ruler. And in, in, it, the answer will not be now, it will be in the long term. We will see if it mm-hmm. will be able to stabilize the system. One sentence. It's a sad commentary on Egyptian-Israeli relations that uh, after all these years, there is such a strong security cooperation, but uh, at least um, uh, above the surface, the Egyptian society and government do not like Israelis to be there, to be uh, seen. And as uh, Boutrous, Boutrous Rally famously said many years ago, it's a cold peace. Just for the sake of our viewers, uh, when we're talking about the cops, it's the Coptic Christian community, which is a, a minority in Egypt. Uh, Ms. Lear, how do you perceive this? And to what degree does uh, uh, do the various uh, uh, actions taken by President Sisi and the armed forces of Egypt uh, secure Egypt's also stability to a degree that the economy is actually able to emerge from this low level? Uh, 
Well, if I can just follow on from Amir's point, um, all the times that I've reported in Egypt and asked people on the street what they think about Israel, there's not a lot of support for the peace deal that was signed in 1979, and we just saw the 39th anniversary of it. If you look at the street names in Israel, a lot of the streets commemorate wars fought with Israel rather than the, the, the peace treaty per se. So it is significant that all the cooperation does happen in secret, because as you mentioned, public sentiment is extremely important. When Trump announced that he was moving his embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, people went out to the streets in Egypt. Egypt, like they did in other Arab capitals. Security is paramount. It's the reason why he gets elected again, not that there was much opposition, but as you mentioned, it ties in very closely with the economy. And if he cannot deliver on the economy, you're going to have this, this group coming up from the bottom. And there is speculation that that could lead ultimately to the same kind of uprising and demonstrations that we saw back in the Arab Spring of 2011. The unemployment in Egypt at the moment stands at around 12%. But of those who are unemployed, 80% are young people. And if you look at the protests in the past, it was the young people that went to the streets. It is the young people that are unemployed. So it's the young people that he needs to address. And and yes, security is one concern, but in reference to your question, if he can't give those people jobs and if he can't stop the anger that is starting, not only starting, has been brewing for some time amongst the young population in Egypt, his 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 rule, uh, his sense of being able to secure both the country and his presidency is going to fall apart. Mr. Owen? Nevertheless, um, granted what you say is, is right, of course, but uh, as long as Egypt bleeds, uh, Sisi cannot do much regarding any aspect uh, of, uh, of his policy. He must stop the bleeding, and that means giving top priority to battling ISIS, whether it's in the Sinai or in the streets or in the uh, tourist uh, uh, resorts, tourist sites, because uh, if tourists don't come to Egypt, its economy suffers uh, even more. So uh, it's security first, and all the rest uh, will have to wait. Dr. I have uh, two comments. Please. Uh, one is that uh, I'm uh, watching very carefully the social media networks and I see that there is a growing positive trend among young people, secular, that praise the peace agreement with Israel, that they see it in a positive eye and the new enemy today is not uh, Israel, is Iran, Turkey and uh, Qatar. Mm -hmm. this is. The other comment, uh, you said it is, it's important, like you mentioned, CCS to create new jobs. If not, he's losing, this is the promise. People let's say there is a frustrations about this uh, uh, aspect, but Sisi uh, began with uh, mega projects inside Egypt, building uh, new cities. The new one is supposed to be, uh, is building uh, El Almen, El Almen city, it's uh, near the Libyan border, uh, and uh, they're supposed to be there a national university, it's supposed to be an eco city, uh, uh, and uh, also uh, there will be about let's say, uh, 500,000 uh, new uh, apartments for young people, new jobs. So he's trying to promote, he's pushing. And in January 2018, he said that, uh, according to international economic uh, researchers, uh, Egypt was in a stable, in a stable uh, stance in, in the matter of economic. And in the beginning of uh, this year, it became positive. He said that so that's why it's, he sees that it's he is estimated that it will only will be approved in the second term. To what degree does uh, uh, President Sisi and, and uh, the Egyptian government at large uh, capable of securing international uh, investments? Of course, there was the whole story with the IMF where uh, they were able to secure after different challenges, a uh, certain amount of money, as well as uh, various agreements with the United States. But of course, there is bu uh, bureaucratic uh, issues of lawmaking that have uh, hindered Washington from actually uh, bolstering uh, the, the regime in Cairo as much as it would want to, at least. And then we have Moscow that has challenges of its own. Of course, the rapprochement with Turkey does not help to its relations with uh, uh, Cairo when we're talking about the regional aspect. But there are different elements that do bring uh, various deals that uh, bolster both uh, uh, the Egyptian economy as well as the security. Is this uh, a trend that we can expect to a, a larger scale or, again, everything falls down to how secure Egypt will remain? 
I think a lot does fall down to how secure Egypt will remain. I mean, naturally, there's an attempt by Sisi to try and bring in international investment. But if you reference the IMF loan that you talk about, there had to be austerity cuts that were put in. The price of food went up by 30 percent. Inflation skyrocketed. So there's a price to pay domestically for any kind of efforts he's doing on the international stage. And we've mentioned a few times that tourists are not coming to Egypt. When you don't have that kind of income flowing in and you have terror that seemingly is not under control, although I know you say it depends who you ask, but the perception is that it is dangerous to um, invest and be in Egypt. And you also have this political turmoil. You're not going to attract mm. any kind of, of foreign investment and people don't necessarily have the confidence. So I would agree with what you said, Amir, that unless he gets a hold on the security situation, you're not really going to be able to advance the economy which needs the international community. Well, we're drawing near to the end of the program, so uh, I'd like to give each and every, every one of you the opportunity to have have your final assessment, if you will, for the second term in office. Mr. Owen, we'll start with you. The deadlock in Washington, uh, where Congress uh, has been uh, blocking or at least hampering uh, the executive branch's uh, wish to help Egypt, is um, giving both Russia and China new opportunities to penetrate Egypt. Now, of course, Egypt in 1955 was the first Arab country where the Soviet Union managed to penetrate via the so-called Czech arms steel. And later, uh, 20 years later, President Sadat uh, kicked the Russians out and invited the Americans in. But President Trump cannot override the uh, Congress and especially Senator McCain and others uh, who are bent on securing freedom for the Egyptians, as well as what, what you mentioned earlier, the IMF economists who lack political understanding and do not really get to the bottom of the problem of where you have a subsidies cut and austerity measures and there is no public support, the government could very well fall. Dr. Barak? In the second term of Sisi, there are three, like we mentioned, there are three main obstacles, the economic one, the terrorist, and also democratizations. Many young people are worried about the situation. Uh, we can find the social uh, media activists in the jail only because they uh, launched something to, uh, to criticize uh, CC on the net. And uh, people uh, call in the social media networks to take actions. They don't, uh, so this is a, a, a worrying uh, trend also. Mm. But uh, CC is dedicated and they uh, want to improve every aspect. So and uh, he's very determined mind to also the strength they ally with Israel. So, uh, Ms. Lear? And I think following on from that, the question is, where does it lead to? Will it lead to riots on the streets that would be incentivized by the young people or not? And how will he respond to that? Will he crack down to keep himself in power? Or will he allow some kind of democracy to play out? And, I, and, and just referencing the recent elections, I think it is important that he was quite submersive and quite strong-handed and not allowing there to be opposition against him. It does suggest that he himself feels that he doesn't have a complete grip and that they, that he's aware of growing dissent within mm -hmm. the Egyptian population. Well, this is all the time that we have for today, so I'd like to thank Dr. Barak, Mr. Yes. Oren, and Ms. Lear for coming here today. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. TV7 Israel's mission is to give you, our viewers, truthful information, which in effect will give you a chance to really understand what is happening in Israel and its region. If you are blessed by our programs and believe our mission to be important, we urge you to support us and become a voice for Israel. You can support us by going to our website at tv7israelnews.com. This program was made possible through your donations.